Um, over the last couple of weeks, um, I've been doing uh, a series called Solid. Tim, you want to go ahead and put it up so we can go ahead and get started, brother? We've been doing a series called Solid. Uh, living solid faith. And, and solid faith has been about us making sure that our vertical relationship with the Most High is solid and that our horizontal relationship with our brothers and sisters are solid. And as we move forward, we talk about what is a solid faith. Sanctified, obedient, loyal, um, having integrity, and being disciplined. Um, and the first thing that we talked about um, in our first week of this, well, let me go ahead and pray for our, well, first of all, let me read our scripture. The lead scripture we've been talking about is Psalms 62 and 6. It says, he is a solid rock under my feet, uh, breathing room for my soul, an impregnable castle. I am set for life again. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for allowing us to come together um, and break bread with the word of life. Lord God, we pray that again, that you would just allow this word to be illuminated in our hearts and in our minds. We pray that you would allow it to be uh, cast um, just like steel into our hearts, Lord God, that we may know and understand and allow this word to permeate every area of our lives, Lord God, that we will seek you in all things and we will honor you in all things, Lord God, because of this word. We just thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So first we talked about sanctification, and we said that sanctification, we're going to go through these, um, sanctification is to be set apart for God's purpose. Um, again, um, our, our scripture for that would be 1 Corinthians 6.11. It says, and, and such were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified, in the name of the Lord Jesus, by the Spirit of God. And so we talked about sanctification and being set apart and how, you know, we go about looking at the, the process of sanctification as if, okay, God, what are you doing in my life? And, and how can I really allow myself to be in a place where you can use me um, for your glory? Um, and I, I just thought about something that, you know, as a kid... I remember, and maybe some of y'all had it too, your mom had this, um, this um, china cabinet. And the china cabinet had those real nice dishes in it. And, and, and you know that those, those dishes did not come out unless it was Christmas, Thanksgiving, you know, not even somebody's birthday, uh, um, you know, unless it was a special occasion. And I just was thinking about that. Um, because, you know, other than that, you know, you had that cup that you used, that saucer or that plate that you used all the time, that, that fork that you used that was bent up. And so we have to, we understand that there are things that we use that have, and the Bible calls it, some for noble purposes and some for ignoble purposes. And so God wants to use us for a noble purpose. And so we find in our lives sometimes that we end up being... Um, uncomfortable in certain situations. We find ourselves being ostracized because we're not like everybody else. Um, we, you know, we get called lame and, oh man, it, you know, he's this or he's that. And, you know, it, it wears on our um, self-esteem because, you know, we like, God, why, why ain't I like everybody else? Why don't I, you know, it's easy. Why isn't, why is it not easy for me to go with the crowd? And it's because you've been set apart. You've been set apart to do something for God. You may not have figured out exactly what it is yet, but you've been set apart to do something great for God. And so one of our first discussion questions, and then also with the discussion questions, I ain't going to get so deep no more on my discussion questions. Uh, <laughs> um, the discussion question for tonight, what steps can we take to pursue sanctification in our daily lives? And I ain't but a few of us in here, so and Ebony in the back eating candy, so. Um, but I expect y'all to answer these little questions that we got. So what can we do? What steps can we take to pursue sanctification in our own, in our daily lives? What can we do? Fasting? 
prayer, spend time in the word, huh? Meditate on the word. You know the word? Joshua said, meditate on this word day and night. Be careful to do with all that is written therein. Therefore, you will be what? Prosperous and successful. So the whole thing about sanctification is, is, is doing all the things that you guys talked about and allowing God to use you in the midst of those things and start setting you apart. Because what happens is, and we know this because we know the people that we hang around. We know the people that, that are always chirping in our ear and stuff because the word of God says what? Bad company does what? Corrupts good character. You can't be sanctified or set apart if you got people around you that are negative, talking about people all the time. You know, you know they, they just don't have anything neg um, positive about their life. They're complainers and all that kind of stuff. You know, the word of God in Psalm says what? Sit not, stand not, walk not. Y'all know that scripture, right? Y'all don't know that scripture in Psalms? What does it say, babe? Stand not. Oh, I ain't going to put you on the spot. I ain't going to put you on the spot. You know, it's just family in here tonight. So um, I'm going to give y'all the scripture real quick. Let me pull it up because I want to quote it right. And we have in Bible study. All right. It's Psalms 1. Verses 1 and 2. Blessed in the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the, of the law, law of the Lord, and in his law he does what? Meditate, like Nick said, day and night. So you got to understand that your sanctification may be held up by the company that you keep. Your sanctification may be held up by the company that you keep. Because you got to, you have to, the word of God says, try the spirit by the spirit. So if you know the people, you know, friends, family, associates, all that stuff, if you know they're not really trying to sincerely, and that's the word that came up today when I was talking to a ministry friend of mine, if you're not sincerely, if they're not sincerely seeking God, you got to ask them, what are you doing? You in my circle, what are you doing? Are you seeking God? Are you really trying to chase after God to be sanctified by him or to be used by God? And we got to know that because if they're not, we need to, because just as it says that your income is the average of the five people you hang around the most, your level of spiritual maturity is going to be at the average of the five people that you hang around the most. Or the person, actually the person that's got your ear mostly. Obedience. Obedience. Our scripture was John 14, 15. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. Obedience is one of those things. Uh, I used to love the Cosby show when he talked about that word. Obey. Obey. I mean, as kids, we, we railed at that word, which means we, we, we didn't want to do it with our parents. We didn't want to do it with our teachers. You know, um, so what happens is invariably when we don't want to obey our parents and our teachers who have been authorities that have been ordained over our lives from a young age, we end up, we, we start rebelling against God. And sometimes we don't think that it's rebelling, but we're not being obedient. And what happens is when we're not being obedient, we think, well, I, I do what God wants me to do. And if you're real with yourself most of the time, a lot of the time, you know, and we're, we're not talking about being perfect by no stretch of the imagination that we're talking about being perfect. But understand, y'all know me. I talk about your heart being perfect towards God so that you can hear what God is saying to you. I mean, the other day, excuse me, the other day, God said something, the smallest thing to me about being obedient to him in it. And I was, I said, oh, I said, God, really? Uh, okay. And, it, and, and something great came out of me just being obedient to him in the small things. Because the word of God says what? It says the small foxes that spoil the vine. So we have to be sure and make sure that even in our obedience that we're, we're, we're not saying, oh, God, I'm being obedient. You know, I'm abstaining from this and I'm not doing that and I don't drink and I don't do this. But 
you got your little personal sins. And we all had them. We all got our little personal sins because I don't, I don't want you guys to, to, to think that I'm standing here having been perfected in faith. None of us are going to be perfected until Christ comes. Okay, so, but what we're doing is, is God's given me an opportunity to come and share his wisdom with you that he pours into me. And I'm still walking this thing out with y'all. We're doing life together. So understand that because we're doing life together, there's going to be some things that because God is judging me more strictly is what the word says. It said those that consider yourself teacher, you, you're going to be judged more strictly. So I have to check up with where I'm at because there's things that you guys come to me about or come to me and Tara about that are life issues. And we want to be able to, to dispense the wisdom of God. And the only way that we can dispense the wisdom of God is through obedience. Because it'd be one thing for me, for you to come and tell me, Polly, this, that, and the third, this, that, and the third, and I tell you what you need to do out of my own wisdom. But I need to be prayerful about, because it's your life. And what happens is, the, the, you know, standing here has eternal consequences. And so I want y'all to know that, that me standing here is not, y- y'all, first of all, y'all know my story. I didn't ask for, to be up here, number one. Number two, I take this seriously because what I say to you all has, it, it ripples into eternity. And I want to make sure that I'm, I'm dispensing, again, the, the wisdom of God, not Paulie's wisdom. Because what I got to give y'all is nothing compared to what the Most High is going to give you. So, our question, how does our obedience to God's command, uh, commands demonstrate our love for him? Y'all got to speak up. I'm finna sip my tea that my wife made. Hey, y'all, my wife back. Yay. Praise God. Whew, I know they got tired of me telling you, I wish my wife was here. question. How does our obedience to God's command demonstrate our love for him? How does it? Bueller? It shows your faith. It can definitely be a challenge. Yeah, because sometimes you think God walking you off a cliff. Can I be honest? Sometimes you think God walking off. Why, God, why would you tell me to do that? But, but, but we don't know that God, because we don't see far enough, God done put a bridge somewhere for you. But because, because you done been down that road so many times, you know, the, you, you know that, hey, that's a cliff over there. But you don't know that God put a bridge there when you wasn't paying attention. And we, because we're not obedient, we can't, it, it, uh, it doesn't allow us to receive the blessings from God because, that come from obedience. And like Matt said, you know, it can be hard being obedient to God because it's, it's counter to society. It's counterculture. It's, it's being obedient to God where we live in a world that says, as, 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 as the Satanist Anton LaVey said, what? Do what thou wilt. We live in that society. We live in a society in, of a moral relativism. We live in a society where people say, what's, what's true for you may not be true for me. Truth, truth is, a, is, a, is a moral construct. There's no absolute truths. But I don't know about anybody else, but this is absolute truth. This is absolute truth. So, so it is. It's, it's one of those things where being obedient, it can be a taxing thing, but at the same time, there's so much peace in being obedient. When you abstain from something that you know God doesn't want you to do, there's such a, a peace in that. When you've come through a fast, you know, and you stuck to the fast, and you, and you stayed true to it, and, and what happens in the midst of that fast, God gives you some sort of revelation in the midst of the fast. So I'm going to implore you in that too. It said, you know, the word God says, some things don't come but by what? Prayer and what? Fasting. So I'm going to implore you guys to incorporate some more fasting into your, into your, um, your worship and your, uh, your devotion time with God. Because I'm going to tell you, it, it reaps untold benefits, not only from a health standpoint, but from a spiritual clarity standpoint. Because, you know, oftentimes what happens is we're so inundated with the noise of the world that 
we can't discern our voice from God's voice. First of all, how you discern God's voice from your voice, if what, if what the, the, what's being said to you, if it lines up with the word, that's God's voice. That's number one. That's, the, that's, that's understanding God's voice 101 is if it lines up with the word. That's number one. So, but when you're fasting, you're clearing out, you're, you're, you're putting uh, uh, muffles on the outside noise when you're fasting, if you're doing it right, if you're praying before you read the word. Because you pray before you eat, right? Hopefully you do. Hopefully you do. Um, pray before you read the word. Because just like you praying before you receive that physical nourishment, and what's in that food is going to be ingested by your body so that your body can be built up. In the same way, you pray before you read the word so that the nourishment that's in that word can be edification for you spiritually. And God's going to reveal something to you when you start fasting. Me, I, I intermittent fast every day. You know, Tara and I usually don't eat. Well, Tara does it better than me. She don't usually eat till the news come on unless she's snacking on something at about 1 or 2 o'clock. But me, I usually don't eat until about 1 o'clock. And I'm trying to be prayerful and make sure that time is God's time. It ain't just me not eating because I'm intermittent fasting. I'm using it as an opportunity to be in my devotion and I make sure what I'm watching, what I'm reading, and what I'm consuming during that time. So incorporate that because it gives you an opportunity to be a little bit clearer in what God's voice is so that you can be obedient to that voice. And then what happens is the anxiety about being obedient to God where it starts to diminish because then you start walking in boldness. And as we, when we go through this, we're going to talk about where that boldness is going to lead us to um, eventually. Next is loyalty. Loyalty, loyalty, loyalty. So everybody wants a friend that is loyal. You know, I've, I've listened to and watched a lot of stuff on um, social media. One of the things that catches me all the time is um, you want somebody that talks good about you when you're not around. You know, you want loyal friends like that. You know, we always talk about somebody being down like four flats on a Cadillac or and all that kind of stuff. You know, how, we know friends that we thought was like that, but they end up not being those type of friends. Because, you know, given a, a given set of situations or circumstances, loyalty will be tested. But you want to make sure that you're that person when it comes to God. And we thought Paul was that guy. I mean, excuse me, Peter was that guy that was loyal because he was already, you know, because, again, I got your back. He told Jesus, Man, I got your back. But when it came time, when 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 it was when the. Um, as my grandmama would say, when the theses hit the rotating oscillator, I'll let you figure out what that means later on, he wasn't nowhere to be found. He wasn't nowhere to be found. He was like, oh, I don't even know that cat. You know, little girl, don't, aren't you what you, what you, I don't know that cat. You know, so we got to make sure that when it comes to Christ, we're loyal. Scripture, Proverbs 3.3 3, let not steadfast love and faithfulness forsake you. Bind them around your neck and write them on the tablet of your heart. It's saying to us, loyalty shouldn't be something that's passe. It shouldn't be something that, you know, we, um, we say and don't um, display. We say it but we don't display it. We say to people that we're loyal, but do we really, when it comes down to it, are we loyal? I've talked to you guys about um, one of my favorite books to read, The Four Agreements. And the first agreement of The Four Agreements is what? Be impeccable with your word. Be loyal. If you say you're going to do something, do what you say you're going to do. If you're really down for me, be down for me. Because what's going to happen is, when you're not loyal, it permeates other areas of your life. You think it's just going to be um, 
consolidated to that little one little area or that one little situation or that one person that you may not have demonstrated loyalty to. But what happens is it's like a fuse. Once you light that fuse, it's hard to put it out and it goes. It just then continues to run into other areas of your life. Because once you compromise yourself in one area, you'll start compromising yourself in other areas. So that's why it's so important that when we talk about loyalty, first of all, to the Most High God, we got to make sure it says, go back to the scripture, Tim. It said, let not steadfast love and faithfulness forsake you. That's loyalty. Bind them around your neck. I mean, like a, like a chain. You know, we see these people got, got these big bedazzled chains and all that kind of stuff now. And it's close to them. You know, and it says what? Around your neck and write them on the tablet of your heart. Make sure that that loyalty is one of those things that is a is a deal breaker for you it, with yourself. I want you to be disappointed with yourself when you say you're going to be loyal to something. And don't. And the first person you need to be loyal to loyal to after the most high God is who yourself. Be loyal to that person that's in the mirror. You know, we, we make contracts with ourselves and we don't fulfill them. We say we're going to do this and we're going to do that. You know, my wife said something the other day. We were out of town. And um, I tried to get up three days a week, get on the treadmill, do the thing so I can get rid of, you know, my shit. And um, so we were out of town. And you, when I'm out of town, I'm out of town. I ain't going to work out, but, but Friday I got up and worked out. My wife came in and said, I'm proud of you. It makes a difference. Because people are paying attention. You know, I just try to be quiet and leave out so she don't hear me. But she said, I'm proud of you. And that meant the world to me. Because, you know, I'm doing it for myself, but it's good that other people are paying attention to it. And somebody's always paying attention to you. Because no matter whether you think so or not, you are a positive influence or a negative one in somebody's life. So just make sure when it comes to, you know, loyalty that you're, um, I like to say this term, and it, it, grammatically it, it doesn't make sense, but I think you'll get the gist. Make sure you, you inspect what you expect. That means make sure you're putting in what you expect from other people. If you want other people to be loyal to you, make sure you're being loyal. Last but not, okay, okay, all right, back to our question. How does loyalty to God impact our relationships and our decisions? Nicholas? Oh, okay. All right. Oh, okay. Well, what? Yeah. How, 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 yeah. How does uh, sound decisions like what? In our relationships, in our decisions. How? When it comes to loyalty. Like, go ahead. Yeah, absolutely. You know, in, in relationships, like my wife. My wife, I have a business partner, and we were talking about that today. She told me to tell you, hey, by the way, I have a business partner, female. You know, my, the one thing I did when I, entered, when, I, when I considered entering into a relationship with her or from a business stand, she met my wife immediately. And now what happens is whenever we're out and there's other non-males around, she talks about the level of loyalty that I have to my wife. You want, you want to make sure that, again, you, you're above reproach in those areas, and that's that loyalty that we're talking about. And, and, um, and the next thing, it, that, lead, that loyalty leads into the next thing, which is integrity. Integrity, a basic definition of integrity is what? To do the right thing when what? No one's watching. You know? Proverbs 11 and 3. The integrity of the upright guides them, but the crookedness of the treacherous destroys them. The integrity of the upright guides them. You always want to make sure that you're, you're, as being a person of integrity, that you allow that integrity to take you into, because you're, because I heard this a long time ago, and I've never forgotten it. Um, 
your ability may get you into places that your integrity won't allow you to stay there. And what that means is you may have this ability to do something or people perceive your ability to do that, but your character and your integrity may disqualify you from that even though you got to that place. That's why integrity is an important part of who our, what our makeup is, and we want to be considered a person of integrity because, again, integrity lends itself to loyalty, lends itself to obedience, lends itself to what? Sanctification. All these things work together, and as the scripture says, you know, go back to it, Tim, the integrity of the upright guides them. When you're an integrous person, understand there's going to be things that God is going to put you in the midst of that you normally would not be in the midst of if you were not an integrous person. Because now he says to you something that God said to me a long time ago in one of my prayers, and I told my wife about it, and it was just a, a, a whole a, an emotional thing for me. When I was praying one night, and God said, I trust you. God said it to me. And I'm just sitting there, okay, God, you know, when I get my devotional time, I just kind of be quiet before I start asking God for what I want. And this particular morning, I was, I was in my devotional time and stuff, and I was just sitting there just ruminating over God and just, you know, I try to mentally be in the throne room. And it was like God just told me. He said, I trust you. And ever since then, even before then, but even more so since then, I've tried to do everything I can to make sure I'm, I'm, I'm making myself worthy of that trust. Do I mess it up? Of course I do. But the thing about it is, again, perfection of the heart towards God. So we want to make sure we're doing that. Question. Nick, why is integrity important in our walk with God and in our interactions with others? Why is integrity important in our walk? Let's break it down. Why is it important in our walk? Because other people may be watching. Other may be, people may be watching you, Nick. So when you say something sideways, I didn't think Nick was like that. And again, I don't, and this is no judgment. When you out, you know, we all have been there where we out with our work colleagues at a social gathering. And you know, we, you know, sipping a cocktail or something. But you go beyond sipping a cocktail because they free, you didn't have three or four of them. And now you, you there, as Steven, as a, um, our boy would say, you there. So is that a good look for God? Because they know you a person that you, you read and you pray, you a man of faith, but now you done got, as Stephen Darby would say, you done got what? There. That's not a good look. Go back to him. So why is integrity important in our walk? Because other people are watching. Okay, so now the other part, with God and in our interactions with others. Why is, it, why, is integrity, why is integrity important in our relationship with God? Why is it important? Why does God want integrity in our relationship with him? Check this out. Y'all know what reciprocity is, right? If we, if we act integrous with God, guess what God does? He gives us back that same integrity. So when we need, when we, when we have need of something, the word of God says he already knows what we have need of, right? So there's, a, there's, a, there's reciprocity with that. Because, again, inspect what you expect. How can I not be integrous with God and expect God to do something for me? I can't. I shouldn't. The word of God says, a double-minded man is unstable in all his way. He said, what? He should not expect anything from God. So the thing is, uh, the integrity that we show towards God, it has to be vertical. And then we also have to show it horizontally because Ms. Dawn was made in whose image? She's a reflection of God. So if I'm being integrous toward him, 
I got to be integrous toward her. We may disagree about stuff, but I still got to show integrity. Hmm? Last but not least, discipline. This is my favorite one because this is my favorite scripture because it's my birthday scripture. And it's probably when I really, really got serious about God, it was the first scripture that I memorized because it's 1211. And if you don't understand 1211 is my birthday, go ahead and put it in your phones now so that, you know, you won't forget 1211. It says, no discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. And we talked about different types of discipline. We talked about punitive discipline, right? We talked about punitive discipline. We talked about discipline as a profession. You know what I'm saying? And then we talked about the discipline that you need to be able to follow the most high. This ain't easy, man. Y'all know this is not easy. As men, we, we wrestle with stuff, you know, going out and being out. You know, if you're halfway cute, good looking, you know, walk around with a ball headed with a gun all the time, folks is going to try to holler at you. And, or, or, you know what I'm saying, or you wear polo all the time. Matter of fact, the person I was talking about just then, you wear polo all the time. Got me wearing polo. But we deal with that. We deal with pornography. Ladies, I don't know all the stuff that y'all do, but y'all have stuff y'all deal with too that y'all got to be disciplined about. Whether it's bad company or, or whether it's, you know, making sure you're, you know, if you have a husband or, or, or a significant other, you know, making sure that you're allowing him to lead, but only if he's allowing God to lead him. Making sure we're in the right place. And if you're a single person, Making sure you're being obedient and allowing yourself to be in a place. Because it says, the word of God says, what? He who findeth a wife. So, you know, as a single person, as a, as a female, you got to already be doing wifely things. Because we ain't looking for girlfriends. We're looking for wives. So if you ain't doing wife stuff, just start doing wife stuff. Just like men. If you ain't doing husband stuff, get yourself together to be a husband. Sometimes it ain't about being financial. It's about getting the space between, above the shoulders and between the ears correct so that when you come upon that woman, that she can see God in you and be willing to submit to you. You know, I told Tara, and I think I've told this story a million times, but I told her when we got married in St. Lucia, I said, look, if I ain't following God, what did I tell you, babe? What's the other part of that? If I ain't following God, don't follow me. That put, that, put, that put a little twang on it right there because now I can't just talk about being a man of God. I got to walk it out in front of her. And the one thing that woman going to be doing, she's going to be paying attention. Just the same thing with women. We paying attention. You say you want to be a Proverbs 31 woman. Do you really want to be a Proverbs 31 woman? Because we can break down Proverbs 31 and we can talk about that Proverbs 31 woman. She was very industrious. She had a hot, whole lot going on. She didn't go to bed at 10 o'clock like me, she stayed up. She kept it going. She made sure the house was squared away. She bought property. So she was, she was in textile. She had all, so the whole thing about it is, if you wanna, we wanna break that thing down, but, but this is the whole thing about it. People don't really talk about this part. Do you know there's a Proverbs 31 man too? I ain't gonna get into it too deep, but, but Remember, it says in Proverbs 31 that her husband trusted in her all the time. But he says he was where? He was at the gate with the elders of the city. So the thing is, if he was at the gate with the elders of the city, what does that mean? He was a man of substance. He was a man of means. He was successful. So you got to be those things if you're trying to be all of those things. So, so, the, so the whole thing about discipline is setting goals. And like I said earlier, when you make a contract with yourself, you can't renege on the contract with yourself. And that's discipline. You know, you, when you set a goal for yourself, do everything you can to fulfill that goal. You know, uh, in Project Manage, we talk about goal, um, things being what? Small, um, what? Measurable, um, 
I can't remember what the smart analogy is right off the top of my head because I'm getting excited. But you have to trackable, and I can't think of what it is, Terrence. You're supposed to help me out with that stuff. Amen. But, but you don't want to, you don't want to um, create goals for yourself that you can't ach achieve. Now, understand this, and I believe this with all my heart, whatever fiber of my being. If it's not too big, if, it, if you don't need God to do it, it's not big enough. If you don't need God for it, if you say, God, if, if you don't show up in this, it ain't going to work out. It ain't big enough. So it's got to be big enough that you need God. But it can't be small enough where it's just a little bitty thing where oh, I can do that. It keeps you in your comfort zone. It, this, this walk is not about being in a comfort zone. Amen? Question, how can we cultivate discipline in our spiritual lives and why is it essential? I try to, I try, I try, I try to not make it a compound question, but it just came out like that. How can we cultivate discipline in our spiritual lives? We talked about that earlier. By what? Reading the word, meditating on the word, making sure you have a discipline in the morning. You know, we talked a while back about small victories in the morning. Small victory what? Making your bed up every day. After that, the next thing should be having some time to spend with God every morning. Making that time up. Go, you know, if you need to get up early, you know, I try to, I try to get up on something with a five in front of it. I try to get up so early, my wife asked me, you okay? Because I want to make sure I'm making time for God in the morning. And that's part of the discipline. You know, for our spiritual lives, why is it essential? Because it gives us a start. You know, I don't know if you guys are old enough to remember. Um, Daryl, I know you remember this. Um, when the Army used to say, we do more before 7 a.m. than most people do all day. That's what getting up early does. When you create a discipline for your life, you, get, you start finding you get so much more done. When, you, when you, walk, you, you wake up early in the morning, whether you get your little workout in or you go straight to your devotional time, after your devotional time, you get up, you may spend a little time you know, getting your body together after that. You know, say, then your day started. And you ain't just rolling into your day. You ain't behind the eight ball. I done been there before. I done hit snooze on the clock before. You know, and, and then what happens is you don't know that 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 being late, that hitting the snooze, it snoozes your whole day. The snooze button don't stop after you get up, because if you lay here, you're going to be late for that. Then you're going to be late for that. You're going to be late for that. That's going to take too long. I thought I was going to be out of here before the end. And then you end up it's seven o'clock and you ain't still ain't got all this stuff done. Create some discipline for yourself. Self-discipline was the last one we talked about. Amen? So now, we talked about solid faith. Sanctification, obedience, loyalty, integrity, and discipline. And the reason that we talked about all of these things is because I wanted to lay a foundation for where we're headed. And what I mean by where we're headed is Philly of Dallas, I've said this since August the 1st, 2022, we have an assignment here in Dallas. We have an assignment to do two things. And um, we have assignment, and that assignment is linked up with our vision. And, um, and I want to say this because I wrote this, so I want to say it. As we conclude our insightful journey through solid Bible study series, we're, we've explored foundational elements of our faith, sanctification, obedience, loyalty, integrity, and discipline. Those elements of our faith will be important as we endeavor to accomplish the mission that we have in the city of Dallas. Again, we have a vision um, for 2024, and our articulated vision is to introduce Yeshua HaMashiach to 500 people over the balance of the year. Wow, 500 people. That's a lot of people. Now, I ain't saying that we're going to have 500 people in here. But I want 500 people to be introduced to Yeshua HaMashiach because of what we're doing. Now, we have means at our disposal to do that. Number one is, of course, inviting somebody to Bible study. Number two, um, what we're going to be doing over the course of this year, we're going to be going out and doing 
some outreach and evangelism. And that's something we're going to talk about here in a minute. We also have social media. I implore you guys, you guys are students of the Bible. Put you a, um, a video together. Send it to me. If it's not theologically correct, I'll let you know. and We'll edit it and get it all together. But I want you to do your part. Because, again, the Great Commission wasn't just for people that stand up and talk to you and, and conduct and moderate Bible studies or preach messages. The Great Commission was for y'all, too. Go ye therefore into all the nations, baptizing, you know, making disciples of the nation, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. That wasn't just for preachers and teachers. That was anybody that calls himself a follower of Christ. So I'm telling you, there's a whole bunch of mechanism and means that we can get to that 500 number. And I want us to keep track of it. I got to find out, babe. Hold on a second. I got I to gotta know what it is so I can share it. Hold on a second. Okay, here we go. I talked about goals. Specific, measurable, attainable, realistic, and trackable or timely. That's what smart goals are. And this is a smart goal. Put it back up to 500 people. That's a lot of people. But again, we ain't saying that they got to be up in the sanctuary. It'd be cool if we could pack the place out. But we want to make sure we're touching the lives of 500 people. This year, we got the heart, we got the means, and we're about to start moving into some places of education where we can get that done. Because next, after that, after the ministry vision, we talk about core values. And core values are fundamental beliefs of the organization. And our core values are to preach and teach the gospel of Yeshua HaMashiach and awaken the true Hebrews of the Bible to their heritage, histories, and the promises of Yahweh. That's our core values. We want to make sure they saved first, and then they know who they are as far as who the people? Who the people? Okay, man. Y'all act like since pastor ain't been doing that, y'all just forgot how to do it. But yeah, we want to make sure we're doing that. And these are, this is what we're going to be committing to. So again, we're, we're about to embark upon a journey. And everybody that walks in here, I want y'all to be partner with me, partner with Pastor Omar, partner with me and Tara and Pastor Omar and Dr. First Lady and all the leadership at the main church and in Atlanta because we're going we're gonna to do this thing. But this is our mission, 500 people here in Atlanta. This is our core values. We're going to preach and teach in Dallas. I'm sorry, in Dallas. This is what we're going to do. How are we going to do that? Mr. Pauly, I don't, I don't, I don't know. I don't like talking to folks about, you know, I'm a little uncomfortable when it comes to talking to folks about the word. I got you. So now we're going to transition to how we can execute the vision for 2024 and demonstrate the core values with a tool that is crucial, that is a crucial aspect for our Christian walk and defending our faith using Christian apologetics. And y'all ever heard of Christian apologetics before? Okay. Christian apologetics is a method that Philly of Dallas will employ to accomplish the assignment. What is Christian apologetics? Christian apologetics, I don't know why I messed up that frame too. Christian apologetics means simply defending your faith. That's all Christian apologetics is. Is defending your faith. And y'all know what defending your faith is. Y'all watch social media. Y'all done seen where people can be preaching on the street corners and stuff and folks come up and, you know, get in their face and all that kind of stuff. Y'all got to be ready for that. Because y'all know, we, I've talked about this before, how this, this um, satanic energy is continuing to increase. People are going to be coming out. I was watching a video today where uh, a guy was on a, a street preacher was talking to this man, and he said, he said, asked him, what are your pronouns? He and them. He's like, he and them? He said, explain that to me. 
he and them. And he went on to talk about how, he said, do you have multiple personalities or something like that? And he said, yeah. Guess what he said his personalities were called? Legions. I'm telling y'all, it's out there in the streets. These are the same streets that those are people that need to be saved. Because remember the man that had legions in him, Jesus cast those spirits out into a herd of pigs, right? So those people deserve to be, have the opportunity to have the gospel preached to them also. And so we got to make sure we have the right tools to be able to share the gospel with these people. So a Christian apologetics, common questions that you're going to get. Am I, am I doing this right? All right, hold on a second. Let me back up. All right. During our lives, we will encounter questions and challenges from skeptics, atheists, and individuals of other faiths. These questions prompt us to delve deeper into our beliefs, to understand them more fully, and be able to listen, to articulate them with clarity and conviction. Philippians um, 1.12 says this. Hold on a second. Did I put it in here? Nope. I don't think I did. I don't think I did. I don't think I did. Um, it says, Philippians 1.12 says this. It says, now I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has, what has happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. As a result, it's become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. And because of my chains, most of the brothers and sisters have become confident in the Lord and dare all the more to proclaim the gospel without fear. It, it, it is true that some preach Christ out of envy and rivalry, but others out of goodwill. The latter do so out of love, knowing that I am, I am put here for what? For the defense of the gospel. So we have to make sure that we are prepared. Because Christians, we, we are the, the most maligned people. I dare you to go out and talk crazy about a Muslim, about their faith. I dare you to go out and talk crazy about a Jewish person, about their faith. You might get arrested you talk to them too crazy. Or an Asian person. But with Christians, y'all know, we, we get maligned. We get people mocking us, people mocking Christ. Why? Because we don't stand up for our faith. We don't defend our faith. And the reason that we don't defend our faith is because we don't know our Bible well enough. We don't know how to defend our faith. It's just like I was messing with Miss Dawn about going and getting her gun class so she can defend herself. We got to get classes where we can defend the thing that we say we believe in the most. Because whether you believe it or not, the questions are going to start coming, y'all. They're going to start coming. And what kind of questions I'm talking about? Why does God allow suffering and the evil one and evil in the world? Have y'all heard that question before? And most of us, we shrink back from it. Why? Because we can't articulate what's in our hearts. We know what's in our hearts, but we can't articulate it in, in that moment because that's an open door for us to share the gospel in a way for people to understand why God does what God does. Another question that we get, how can we trust, that the, Bible, trust the Bible as a reliable source of truth? Y'all done heard that one from a long time. It's a white man's Bible. It's been, you know, it's so many translations, you know, they didn't change it up and all that kind of stuff. We didn't heard that before. You didn't heard it before, but you can't defend it. You don't even get into the conversation because you can't defend it. We got to be able to defend this thing. And people ask you why you believe the Bible, and you, your answer can't just be it's the word of God. It's true, but it can't just be it's the word of God. Last question. Isn't Christianity just one of the many equally valid paths to God? If you ask Oprah, she'll say yeah. But we know that not to be the case. The word of God says what? If any man come in by me, he is what? Thief and a liar. It's the only way in is through Christ. 
a lot of the other stuff is good. Don't get me wrong. The Hadith, the Satama, all these other books, they're good. They have some good say. But if you if you ever read those things, which I've read a lot of those things, they still point to a lot of the principles that are in the word of God. The Quran itself says, and we'll talk about that later as we start going through this. The Quran says itself. The gospel is to be trusted. Above any other book, Muhammad wrote that. Will he say he really couldn't write it because he was supposed to be illiterate? But so understand. We have to be able to we have to be ready to defend questions like this. You know, um, like question one, we'll go back to it real quick. I'm sorry. Question one. You know, it, this question challenges the understanding of God's sovereignty, goodness and his justice. It prompts us to explore the theological concept of free will. You have to be able to understand that. And the consequences of sin and God's redemptive plan through suffering. Question two. Question two is one of those questions. Let me get back to it. Um, skeptics often uh, question the reliability and the authenticity of the Bible, prompting us to defend its historical accuracy. And check up at this. Um, its internal consistency and manuscript evidence. This question leads us to examine the Bible's archaeological, prophetic and manuscript support. And number in question number three, in our pluralistic society, this question challenges the exclusivity of Christianity and prompts us to defend the uniqueness of Yeshua HaMashiach as a son of Yahweh and the only way to salvation. It leads us to explore evidence of Jesus' deity, his resurrection, and the fulfillment of the Old Testament prophecies. Because you'll get with people um, like Muslims where they'll talk about, they understand something, Muslim people know more about Jesus than most Christians do. You know, I got a friend in Lafayette. We go eat at his restaurant all the time. We had a wonderful conversation when we first met. When he talks about Jesus, his, his statement, and you'll hear it from Muslim people, after they say Jesus, they'll say what? Peace and blessings be upon him. Don't need to say that because Jesus is peace. He's the king of peace. But because they only see him as a good prophet, the highest prophet other than Muhammad, but we got to be able to defend him as being the part of the hypostatic union. You know, I just gave you another one. The hypostatic union is meaning that Christ is all God and all man together in one. We got to be able to understand that stuff and, and teach that stuff. Share that stuff in a way that's not obtrusive. So I, what I want y'all to do is go back. I'm going to go back to these questions. I want y'all to go back, Tim. Tim, bring up the slide real quick for me, please, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Write down these questions. Text them to yourself. Take a picture. Thank you. Thank you, Nick. Take a picture of the screen. Because what I want you guys to do, I'm about to go to question two, unless somebody tell me to hold up. Question two. And question three. Oh. I'm going to go back. Just take a picture. Okay. Get a new phone. <laughs> Let me know I can go ahead. All right. Question three. Sis, can you, you can go get Lucius. So as we begin this journey of Christian apologetics. I want us to approach it with a couple of things. I want us to approach it with humility, with wisdom, and a deep reliance on the Holy Spirit. Because again, Christian apologetics is defending your faith. So I want to make sure you're relying on the Holy Spirit. We should pray that our study and defense of Christian faith be rooted in love grace and truth, ultimately pointing others to the hope found in Yeshua HaMashiach alone. 
Now, this is going to be a first for y'all. I'm going to give y'all some homework. Number one, I want y'all to take the questions that you have taken pictures of or text to yourself. Do some, through research and study, develop answers to those questions that you feel comfortable defending. Okay? I want you to, I want you to take those questions, and through your own study, I want you to figure out a defense of the, that question that you feel comfortable with, with your level of knowledge to understand. Number two, think of other questions that people use to discredit Yahweh, Yeshua, the Bible, and Christianity, and develop answers to those questions also. So next week, I'm going to hope, we got three questions tonight, I'm hoping y'all going to come with some more questions that people use to discredit Christianity. But the most important thing that, we've talked, that, that we have not talked about tonight is having a solid relationship with Yahweh um, and our brothers and sisters and having boldness to share and defend our faith. But it first requires something of, from us. First, oh, I go back. Oh. Go back to ABC. Tim, if you don't mind. Go back to ABC for me. First, we have to admit that we are sinners. Next, we must believe that Yeshua HaMashiach died on a cross for the remission of our sins, was buried in a grave, and rose with all power on the third day. Lastly, we must confess that Yeshua HaMashiach is Lord and Savior of our lives, and we submit our will to his. We have to first be saved. Because it's going to take a lot for you to stand in front of people that say you crazy, say you're, you know, you sheep. Um, they got so many different things they say about Christianity. And again, um, they would never go to a Muslim and say stuff one-on-one. -on -one to a Muslim about their faith. Now they may go with a crowd of people and say something about Muslims because they got somebody, feel like somebody got their back, but they wouldn't do that to a Muslim. They wouldn't do that to a Jewish person or a person of any other faith. They just do it to Christians because most of us, we can't defend our faith. The thing we say we believe in the most and we, the thing we say that, we, that saved our lives and allow us to live in eternity we can't even defend it. The only reason we can defend our family and our mothers when people talk about them is because we know them. Because we know them, our friends, because we know them, our family, our teammates, all these things, because we know them, we have an intimate relationship with them, we can defend them. That's why we gotta have an intimate relationship with him. Because we gonna have to defend him. So everybody stand real quick. We're going we gonna to go through a prayer of salvation. I know most of y'all saved in here, but it's okay for us to walk through a prayer of salvation again. And we're all go, also going to go through a prayer of restoration because we got to be restored. We got to make sure the Holy Spirit is dwelling in us because we're about to walk into this thing called Christian apologetics. And it's going to take a lot. It's going to take a lot for us because we have to defend our faith. Just like Nate um, has to gear up when he's protecting a property. He's protecting us tonight. We got to gear up with the word. We got to gear up with the word. You know, and, and the other thing that Nate does, because um, not even just gearing up, but he's proficient with his equipment. You know, I go shooting with him, and he talks about the groupings that he can make because he's a very good shot. We got to be able to shoot straight. We got to be able to make sure we focused in on our targets. The only way he's able to do what he's able to do is because he spends time with his equipment. Do we spend time with our equipment? So I'm challenging you tonight to think about those things as we pray and just ask God to come into your heart right now and prepare you 
so that you can equip yourself and so you can prepare to spend the time that is needed so that you can be proficient with your tools so that you can go out and defend this gospel. So every head bowed, every eye closed. Just repeat after me. Heavenly Father, y'all can say it loud. <laughs> we come before you acknowledging our need for your saving grace. We confess our sins and shortcomings and we humbly ask you for your forgiveness. Lord, have mercy on us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Lord, you are the great restorer. We bring our lives before you as those who are broken, weary, and in need of your healing touch. Heal our broken hearts and bind up our wounds, O Lord. Lord, we sometimes find ourselves lost and wandering. Far from your embrace, Please draw near with your spirit and continue to lead us into a transforming relationship with you. Open our hearts to your love and open our hearts to your truth. Lord, we pray for restoration in our relationships and in our communities and in our world. We pray that your reconciling love bring healing and wholeness where there is brokenness and division. Let your peace reign in our hearts and in our world. Lord, we thank you for hearing our prayers and for your faithfulness to save and restore. We praise you now and forevermore, in the name of your son, Yahshua HaMashiach, amen. Thank y'all. Thank y'all tonight, man. And like I said, tonight was just the beginning. We're going to go in and we're going to start getting into some apologetics so that you guys will be ready to defend your faith. I mean, that's going to be the main thing going into, you know, these troubled times that we're in right now. So I want you guys to be prepared when someone comes to you and, and, and refutes the fact that, you know, that Yeshua HaMashiach is who he is and, and all these things. Because a lot of people, when they come to you with these things, they're not coming to you really because they don't believe or they hate. They don't know enough. And, and, and because of the society that we live in, people don't know how to ask for help. They don't know how to ask questions. Everybody want to make it seem like they know everything. So what happens when that hap what, what happens then in those cases is they come off like, oh, that ain't this or that ain't that. But they really want you to sit them down and say, no, that you, you can be further from the truth. I understand where you may not believe, but let me share something with you. Because we because many of us don't know how to do it any other way, because that's what the world says we should do it. But Y'all going tonight. May the Lord bless you. May he keep you. May he cause his face to shine upon you and uh, be gracious unto you. And may the Lord lift his face unto you and bless you with shalom. Shalom. Peace. Y'all have a good night, man. Love y'all.